Hi there. Welcome back to Getting to Know Us, our series we're running at Voice for Men, talking to some of the main participants at A Voice for Men and, of course, the presenters at the first International Men's Issues Conference in Detroit. Today I have with me Aaron Pizzi, who has been working for a very long time in the area of domestic violence. Hello, Aaron. Hello. All right, let's jump right in. Here's my first question for you. In 1971, you started one of the very first domestic violence shelters in the United Kingdom, and you very quickly came to realize that there's an important distinction to be made between battered women and violence-prone women. Can you tell us what that distinction is and why you think it's so important? Because I think it applies both to men and women, my definition, actually. Uh, I, I defined women, in, in this case we talk, I was taking in women, women who were victims of their partner's violence, but themselves had had no violence in their backgrounds and had had good, warm, loving relationships with their parents. By accident, getting themselves involved, very often because they're trying to rescue a man, and they, and thereafter, they find out that he actually, behind his mask of sanity, he is dangerous and violent and dysfunctional. Now they needed refuge, they need a lawyer, they need a safe place, but essentially they can move on with their lives very quickly. The women that I was most concerned with that were coming in, and I was no stranger to this subject because my mother came under this heading of uh, a woman who is who is a victim of her own violent background and she married my father who was a violent bully and she never left him she used to take take off and then come back and take off and come back like so many women do and it was that these women who were victims of their own violence and either got into one violent relationship and could never leave and kept going back or if they got out of one relationship would then choose another and those are the women that I said needed help they needed counseling and they needed to work with people who actually understood that as far as I've always been concerned I think that relationships can be just as as addictive as alcohol or drugs that's the way I looked at it and of course everybody laughed at me but now it's becoming more and more apparent that what I was saying 40 years ago because I was accused of being of hating women of being a traitor to the movement of all the things that you know um, and I was saying no I, what I'm offering women is another way out and then I wrote scream quietly and prone to violence particularly is the book that was only on the shelves for three weeks but that's the book discussing my treatment program for violence prone people and children. Okay, you were born in China to a very large family, 17 children. Um, no, that, no, that, no, that was my father. He was one of 17. He was the oh. 17th. I was born in, in Tsingtao. We moved to Shanghai. I had a twin sister then and uh, we were captured by the Japanese. So I was sort of born into war. I left when I was about four and a half and we were under house arrest and held hostages and then we were on the last boat out of China to be exchanged for hostages, Japanese hostages. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, how, do you, how do you think um, those early experiences, I'm wondering if those early experiences played any role in your ability to see the complexity of violence where other people seemed either willfully ignorant or genuinely ignorant and yet you were able to see that it was a far more nuanced situation than, than is generally presented. Do you think those early experiences had anything to do with that? Well, I do, but you see, you have to remember my early experiences. About the age of four and a half, I realized my mother couldn't stand the sight of me. That's what really made me realize. She would never touch me. She, would, she was a very cold, narcissistic woman, and she, I looked just like my father, who she hated, my mother was the original parental alienator. My father couldn't draw breath without it being evil, according to her. And uh, she was all right with my twin sister because my twin sister looked like her. But in many ways, it was harder for my twin sister because she cannibalized her. 
But I, realizing that I was rejected, she used to, her, her motto for me was, born to be hanged. <laughs> so I know, but you know, in a way, I was safer because I knew where I was. I find it much, much harder for people who can't work out their relationships with their parents because it's love and hate. Mine was purely, in the end, indifference to her. I have had a very similar experience too. I don't remember a time when I ever thought my mother was sane. She was yeah. also incredibly violent. And you're right, in a way it's easier to just be hated because at yeah. least you know where you stand. Exactly, exactly. Hey, the early reactions to your work from politicians like Jack Ashley were really positive, but as you said, you got a lot, a lot of negative reaction to your work as well. Well, um, I think... Who were the main critics of your work, and what is it that they thought you were doing wrong? Okay. You have to remember my history, and it's in a book called This Way to the Revolution, which is on Amazon. My history is that I was absolutely... I was, I was in awe of the idea of a women's movement. We needed it so badly in 1971. You know, I mean, when I tried to get married in, in 1961, I had to prove to the doctor that I was going to be married before I could have any contraception. Uh, you know, women in those days, well, we, you have to have a man's signature if you wanted a mortgage. Um, and there were things that needed to be changed. So I was all about change. And I remember going to the early um, uh, meeting of the, the group that was my, my group in, in Chiswick in London where I opened the refuge. And I remember looking at this girl, and she, sa she said, why have you come to the meeting? And I said, because I'm lonely and isolated, and I want somewhere where I can work with other women. And she looked at me, and she said, your problem isn't lonely and isolated. Your problem is your husband. He's oppressing you. So I said, gobsmacked, hang on a minute. He goes to work. He brings in the money so I can be home and bring up my children, which is my greatest wish was to be married with children. And she, I suddenly realized that this was not going to be about women. This was Marxism. I know so much about it and in those days because my parents were cap captured. In 1949, they were under house arrest for three years and we were at boarding school and didn't see them. My little brother was with them. And they came out three years later. But the stories that they told me made me realize that the whole concept of communism was extremely dangerous. And of course, I was laughed at because the intelligentsia on the left in the Western world embraced the whole concept of Marxism totally, if you remember. You were much too young to remember. Anyway, after being thrown out of the women's movement, I went off and started what my vision was, which was a small place for women who could meet, who were at home and had time on their hands, bring their children, and we could all share what we could do together and work in our community. And it was hugely successful. Women poured through the doors who were in trouble of one sort or another and didn't want to go to the social services and, and the various agencies. Then a fatal day, Kathy came in and she took her jersey off and she was livid with bruises all over her because her husband, Wally, had taken a chair to her, a chair leg. And I took her home with me that night. And that, from that day on, that was the first time anywhere in the world a place was opened purposely to harbor men, women, and children. I and mean, it was women who came first. But you have to remember, as soon as I could, I tried to open a house for men. But by within a matter of months, because I knew this was going to happen, and nobody would listen to me, the women's movement that was forming had run out of steam and media coverage. They were desperate for funding and they were desperate for a just cause. And the whole concept of domestic violence fell into their hands across the Western world. And so domestic violence was the fault of the patriarchy, i.e. all men, all women were innocent victims of their partner's violence. And I was picketed and screamed at and threatened and hated. Uh, well, for a vet, still am. So it's forty yeah, it's forty years now. My goodness, it's it's actually become a bit of a truism in popular culture now that women are subjected to an incredible amount of 
uh, threats and violence through social media and that this has a terrible impact on them and people who are interested in exploring the issues from both male and female perspectives are portrayed as being violent and threatening um, but in actual fact you have been the recipient of threats and actual violence from protesters who are supposedly innocent victims I mean I know. Tell us about your experiences and like who is threatening you and why are they threatening you because of money because uh, what I realized I was then um, but a little while later a couple of years later about 74 invited to I we made a film it was the first film in the world on domestic violence and it was called scream quietly or the neighbors will hear this is what one of the husbands said when he was beating up his wife and she repeated it to me we made the film with a young filmmaker who had no political agenda it was made by the women with him and we were asked uh, to to uh, to put it on um, what is your public network your PBS yeah PBS and then I got a note from Gloria Steinem to say because nobody knew who we were she would have to front it and being very naive I wrote back and said well that's all very well but I want you to promise me that whatever you do you don't politicize this because there should also be refuges for men and well how silly was I because when I got to New York uh, that's what ha what happened I, I watched the film and she fronted it and at the end made it very clear that it had been hijacked by the, the feminist movement and uh, I then went to uh, I went to Colorado and Denver where I met Leonora Walker and to explain to her the whole concept that I had and uh, I didn't realize of course you know she was then a marriage um, um, advisor counselor and uh, I just played into their hands but you know I was so stuck because as I traveled everywhere I could see all these people filling in all these forms because to raise the money to get money from all the big trusts and the government and everything else and I was thinking to myself well why why are you doing this because what you need to do is to open a refuge you know and nothing was actually happening except all this money was beginning to pour in to the women from the feminist movements and but then you see that was all that was being offered in terms of refuge and I just had to think it doesn't matter what I feel for the moment any refuge is better than no refuge and so I just traveled several times to America and did as much as I could to help set them up but I uh, you know as you know now no no men can work in refuges no men can sit on boards in many refuges boys over the age of 9 or 12 aren't allowed in and their mothers have to make other arrangements for them and the same applies in England and it's now a billion dollar industry and and it's going to take an enormous amount to actually as far as I'm concerned to it's been a huge fraudulent operation I think the leaders of this movement should be jailed because this is money that's been actually spent under false pretenses it's been raised under false pretenses and it's been spent under false pretenses particularly VAWA the violence against women act because most of that a lot of that goes towards running uh, courses uh, are called the Duluth model which is abusive to men who are forced to actually take that correctional option. Goodness. So billions of dollars is being poured into this. And if it's not being used to create refuges, what is it being used for? Where does the money go? Well, you've asked the feminist movement because they are actually unaccountable. There are no there have been no research by anyone on what happens in refuges how many times the women come and leave there's no research on how effective it is there's no there's no public uh, as far as I can see disclosure of the accounts and the accounting what it does go on I'll give you a little picture of what happens in England you get invited to go and uh, see one of the, the, the refuges first thing that happens 
you won't get to the refuge, you'll get to an office in the city, wherever the refuges are, for instance, let's say Bristol. You go into the office and it's jobs for the girls. In one case, I went to the office and there were seven women, all employed with very good salaries. One was an outreach worker, the other was, they all had titles. When I actually did manage to find the refuge and walk in, it could only take two women with a couple of children and one single woman. That's all the space they had. So imagine how much money was going into running the office and the, and whatever else they spent it on. But they were only able to actually offer three places. So they're paying salaries to seven people yeah. to offer three places. Mm -hmm. Well, the same goes, follow the money, right? I suppose in this yeah. case... Uh, but we yeah. must, I must say, there are, and I have been to them, refugees that are trying very hard. They do include male workers. They do actually understand the issue. There's very few of them, but they exist across the Western world. But the problem is, they are then, if you employ any men, you are actually not allowed to join, for instance, in England, the National Federation of Women's Aid. You aren't allowed to be any part of that, and they run most of all the refuges, apart from Refuge, which was the the place I bought and was my refuge and I'm not even allowed up the stairs of that refuge now. Well, that's crazy. If you, if you could pick one aspect of domestic violence besides the money issue, which I'm very stunned by, it's probably the one I would pick, but if you could pick one aspect that you would want popularized through the media, that you would really want people to understand and just get what what would that be? What do people need to understand the most about domestic violence? I think the thing they most under have to understand is if children are exposed to domestic violence, to toxic relationships, to dysfunction and to sexual abuse, you actually physically damage the brains of these children. They can prove that now with MRI scans that even in the uterus when you smoke a cigarette, you share it with the baby. When you have a drink, you share it with the baby. When you have chemicals of rage and violence and anger and fear, the baby experiences all of them and is born damaged. When the baby is born, our, all of us, our brains are plastic, only semi-formed. And after, thereafter, you have to remember that experience is the architect of the brain. And once people grasp that and grasp that there's been 40 years of fraudulent behavior that has denied the children the right to be seen as the real victims. If I can get that message across, that and before I die, I want to know that we have completely eradicated this feminist, so-called feminist movement uh, because we need to actually see it as it is, it's generational. It's a family issue, it's generational, and this is the only way we're going to make a change, is when men and women join together and protect children. I couldn't agree with you more, I'm, and I'm very dedicated to the exact same mission. Now, oh, let's you. say I took every penny, every penny of domestic violence money, and I gave it to you. What would your system of training and refuges look like? What, how would you do with the money? Well, what I, what I did, and the, and, and the model that I chose, well, actually, I didn't choose it. It happened because, because the, as soon as the first women came into the refuge, the women who had volunteered with me in the refuge disappeared, quite understandably, because of so many of the women, as an example of the first hundred women that came in, 62 were violent and violent to their children, and the others were innocent victims. So I would see... I, you have to have open houses, open projects where people can get day or night because otherwise they can die if they don't get in. And we had a completely open door. No one was ever turned away. We were very illegal. I was the biggest squatting. I don't know if you have squatting in America, Canada or America. We just took houses that the, that the government hadn't bothered. They'd done them up and left them empty. We took hotels. Our biggest hotel was, it had uh, 48 private suites and it had been empty for years. So we were a big, big group of women and children and men. And uh, so that's how we were able to rehouse everybody as they came in. And what we f I formed was the idea of a very big, loving, warm family. I was mum and Mike Dunn 
who's an ex-priest and a rugger player, huge guy. He was the father figure. And then we had our house mothers in all our houses. And they were sort of granny figures. And the big house, which is the, with the open door, you could come any time, day or night. If you, we then had second stage houses. This is where women could choose to live with each other, four or five families at a time, because they were big houses, and they formed communities. So they didn't go out and become isolated as single parent, very badly hurt mothers. But they had their the strong friendship, and then gradually, as they grew to where they felt they could actually rejoin real life they'd then move out, but they'd have a seed community to always go back to. And I want the same projects to apply to men equally. I, I don't actually honestly think in the beginning that you could mix um, um, men and, and women together in the beginning because I think everybody needs time out to heal from what's happened to them. Okay, you're going to be um, speaking in Detroit at the Men's Issues Conference, and we're very pleased. I'm really looking forward to meeting you. What will your subject be? What will you be talking about there? Well, there are going to be so many experts who do actually uh, understand and, and know about domestic violence, but I'm the only one probably with the history of running refugees, not only in England, in Chiswick, but I then moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico when I had my own small refuge. And then I've moved to uh, the Cayman Islands and then I was in Italy. So I have that direct experience of what constituted this massive fraud that has gone on since 1974 was the big historic moment when I realized that this is what was happening. And it has gone on ever since then. So I'm going to talk about the radical feminist movement stealing money from desperate women and children. Good for you. And that is something that we need to be discussing. We absolutely do. I want to talk specifically about websites like A Voice for Men and the uh, men's human rights movements. Now, you have been doing this a very long time, and I assume you know all the best ways to do things and all the worst ways to do things, too. What are we as as a nascent civil rights movement, what are we getting right about domestic violence? And more importantly, what are we getting wrong? Is there something, that, some way that we could improve the way that we are approaching the topic of domestic violence? I think what the, one of the first things we could do, which would make a huge difference, is to stop bitching about how many women hit women, men and how many men hit women, because that's not the issue. The issue is, if you're born into a violent family, you will be affected whether you're a boy or a girl. And uh, uh, so, th th as soon as you start this business of, because what you're doing is, is in a sense, making the patriarchy a firmer idea, because you've got women saying, well, it's all men's fault, and men, men saying it's all women's fault, and the result is it's complete stalemate, and nothing gets done. There's just two hostile sides. We need to all come together and recognize that this ho the whole thing has been a hoax, actually. Under the guise of uh, a women's movement, it was like the Trojan horse. Once the horse was wheeled into the city, out came all the enemy, and they were the radical lesbians and the radical feminists. We were all equity feminists at that point. We all wanted, that's how they, they, they drew everybody in because both men and women in England, and I know in America and Canada, both wanted uh, e equality for women, but that was the blind. Hmm. What's one thing that people can do on a personal level? I mean, I, my husband and I are very close friends with a man whose wife almost killed him in domestic violence. Um, there is no chance he would report that. He was simply not willing to be to face the public humiliation. He's a big guy, she's a tiny little woman, and she regularly beats the crap out of him. Now, they are now divorced, um, but there was, it, I felt so powerless, so helpless, that there was nothing that I could do. What is it that people can do to help when you see someone living through a violent relationship? I think the first step, I can only tell you when a woman came comes into to the refuge, and I'm and I know that she because it's day one she's just been rescued she's got her kids with her, and you sit down with her, 
and you know that she's going to be euphoric because she feels safe. Day two, she's busy because she's got a lot of arrangements to make. Day three is going home day, I call it, because this is when those that are addicted feel the need to go back. And I promise you, if you've ever been in an addictive relationship, and this can be a boyfriend, it can be just something you've been through where you suddenly looked at somebody and you think, wow, and, that, and it's just like two bolts of electricity touching each other. That's what an addictive relationship feels like. To a certain extent, it's normal and people fall in love. That's the healthy feeling. But in violent relationships, it's nothing to do with love. It's actually people meeting their bad needs with each other. But the main thing is to get her to understand that it is an addiction, what she's feeling. And the only chance, because she'll say to you, he says, you'll kill me if I go back. I say, yes, but here you are. You're going back. And we used to have pictures on the wall of women who died going back with their names and the dates and uh, said say you've got to think of him as a heroin pusher he's your dealer your only way out is cold turkey and it is the only way out do you think the same dynamic works for men because I I know absolutely. that absolutely oh absolutely yeah. oh no there's no differences no differences you know and 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 it's the same with men and they'll they'll make lots of excuses oh i can't leave her because she needs me she won't live without me oh this oh that no it's addiction and when they you know and they, they, there they are bees beaten beaten and bruised and knives stuck into them saying oh well she 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 really does see it's not the difficulty is they're very they're very traumatic relationships and it's like being in the middle of a massive war and when you take the war away what's left and if all you've ever known about a relationship because you've been a battered child this is normal this whole world that you and I are talking about is is very scary I remember taking a group of most violent children I had to a headland in Greece for six weeks putting them in a place where there's no raping there was no possibility to steal there was no excitement nothing and I remember one of the boys, he was standing in this beautiful sea, screaming, I can't stand the peace. And I thought, yeah. And they had peace. And the miracle was, after six weeks, they actually watched them all diving off a rock, and they'd formed a queue. That would never have happened when they first came. They'd been pushing each other up and trying to drown each other. But peace, that's, that's what you have to, to teach them. Well, wow, that sort of speaks to my own childhood. I mean, I don't know why I survived, um, but I have never, I grew up super violent with very, very violent parents, and then the idea of any sort of violence as an adult repels me. So as my children have never been struck. They've been extremely protected from that. What do you think the difference is? I mean, I, I can't tell you why I ended up that way. Um, I'm certainly glad that I did. But how do we help these children who are growing up in violent families? How can well, we save them? That's why the mothers and I decided from the very beginning, the first bit of money we had, we employed a good gentle man. And, uh, the, and I think the most important part, for me anyway, is that I had a mentor. And I, that's why we had the men, because they were acting as mentors alongside the women. And playing all the different roles that men can play. Some of the men were elderly, some were very young. And the thing, the idea being that that's why I wrote Infernal Child, because I was a very, very dangerous child, very, very violent. And uh, uh, it wasn't until I was nine years old, and I was had to, my parents were captured, and I was in a holiday home for children whose parents were abroad, and I met Miss Williams. So I've written a memoir called Infernal Child. She was six foot seven. She never raised her voice. There were 40 of us. She never raised her voice. She was a golf champion. She'd driven um, ambulances during the war, and she was a magistrate. And I looked at her, and I thought, that's who I want to be like. And I, she, that's the first person in my life that I'd respected. And I, that's why mentors are so important for children. And sometimes a child can find it in another member of the family. Sometimes it can be a sibling. Sometimes I, four and a half, experienced uh, uh, a spiritual experience for me. And that's probably also what saved me because I knew I was loved. I knew I was loved beyond all human capacity to love. And it, 
It isn't an organized religion or religious feeling. It's just that I love God in all his aspects, which applies to everybody. And that's what's really been with me right through all this. Because at times, I mean, I've lost twice. I've lost my house, my daughter's house, my cars. I was virtually driven to bankruptcy in America and then again in Italy. And um, they're very powerful, those women in this in this movement, you know. And they're everywhere. You never know. You never know that the law you're talking to has another agenda. Or in my case, uh, editors of books, because I've published a lot of books, and uh, you find out too late. Mm. The reality is, is that there are very few services for men who are going through domestic violence in North America and presumably in the UK as well. Any, anywhere in the world. Australia is so, probably worst. Yeah. What is your advice for men who are living through this right now? What, what would you advise that they do? Well, the first thing I think they should do is to get online and go to a voice for men because there's a whole world up there that will help them. I think that's really important. Then look uh, and see if they can find a men's group somewhere where there are. For instance, we have, I'm a patron of Mankind, which is a men's group that will help men with women. It's interesting how many, all the men's groups work with women. And, uh, in, and we also have, um, uh, in England, there's very little else. There's families for fathers who deal with custody issues because parental alienation is one of the biggest issues we have to face because it is child abuse. And uh, um, and I, I remember coming across a voice for men virtually by accident and just feeling this, it wasn't all that long ago, it was about three years ago I found it, huge feeling of relief because before then I was so isolated. I mean, I, the isolation, particularly in England, we have virtually almost nothing for men. So it's, it's, and I've tried to work with men's groups, but so many of them failed because of the infighting. They all wanted to be chiefs, and I didn't want it to be Indians. I used to deal with them. And the other thing, too, which is very true, I used to say to them, look, you, you could, if I asked you to design a bridge, all of you together, you'd do it. If I asked you to set up a company, you'd do it. But because you don't know how to relate to each other emotionally, you are completely lost. And this is true. There's no history of men meeting each other's needs emotionally. Hmm. They go to women. Men define their relationships through their relationship with a woman. That's very interesting. So when women are rejecting their relationships, it has a fairly profound effect on men's humanity then. Well, because because there's, I've often said this to a man, you know, part of the reason you're so angry with your wife is because you're so emotionally dependent on her. And and and, it, 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 the, and women, are the, I've always said this, in the refuge, I would notice how resilient the girls were that came in and how incredibly badly damaged the boys were and the damage went on, particularly if it was the mother. It was absolutely tragic. It's catastrophic, actually. And uh, uh, I'm, 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 I asked Miles Groff, I think that's how you pronounce it, he's actually also at the conference, coming to the conference, and, and he, he understands completely what I'm saying, because as he explains, men are actually much, much less, what's the word, resilient than women. They die much earlier, under the age of one, it's mostly little boys who die. They get murdered. Their, uh, their fra health is more fragile. You know, they're more likely to get murdered just across the board. I mean, it's a, it's a dangerous place these days to be a man. I think the feminist response to that is, well, why don't we just destroy masculinity then? I mean, if it's such a problem, why don't we just get rid of it? What would you say to that? Well, that's because it's the old Marxist idea that it's, it's, it's nurture, not nature. And the fact is, as now that it's proved beyond any reasonable doubt, men and women's brains are biologically set up differently. Yes, of course, nurture has a great deal of effect on it. But on the whole, men aren't the danger. The idea that if women are... We've got this idiot, Harriet Harman, who's sometimes our women's minister, but she's very powerful in the Labour Party. And uh, her attitude is that if we got rid of men, the world would be an absolutely wonderful place and uh, no, there'd be no violence at all. She seems to forget that nobody talks about the concentration camps in Germany that were run by women. The famous one was called Ravensbrück. 
and they were actually many of them more cruel than any of the men oh, yes, I, I wonder if she would like to live in a world run by our mothers I suspect there would be a little bit of violence there oh with the well then I just suspect what her background is because her attitude towards men she's the one who actually wrote a policy paper for the Labour Party which states that men are not necessarily harmonious to family life <laughs> I know, and and she has pursued that policy with a vengeance. Like most other Western countries, these women who were young in my day when I first started are now in very powerful positions. Whether it's Hillary Clinton or it's uh, Harriet Harman here or, or or whoever else in the states and Canada, I know, I know that, that uh, I was always interested because uh, Senator Anne Cools and I are great friends. I joined her about 10, 11 years ago to do a huge tour of Canada. As you know, my mother was Canadian. She was born up, she was in Ottawa, a little village, I think it's called Poulton. And uh, I was there as a child. I was at school in Toronto. Um, and I was very interested. And of course, I found Canada the most frightening of all the countries I've been to. And most terrifying in terms of absolute power and control of all the agencies in your government particularly the children's agencies and it's I found it very frightening we do have some issues that's that's uh, for certain and this conference that we're organizing in Detroit is one of the very first um, organized formal ways to start coming up with solutions yeah. let me ask you as a as a final um, question what's the first change in law or in society that you would like to see to start recognizing the destructiveness of domestic violence for everybody who's involved what's the first change I think the first change has to be public recognition and speeches given by people in positions of power that is in governments and people who can speak out to say that they now recognize that it has never been a patriarchy it has never been a gender issue. It is a family issue, and as a family issue, it is dealt with by both men and women. And refuges will actually, and safe places, and teaching and education will be done for both boys and girls. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I'm really looking forward to meeting you and hearing you in Detroit. And I hope that all our viewers will be on the phone buying their tickets to hear this very fascinating woman speak in Detroit. Thank you, Erin Pizzi. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.